Today we're going to talk about it, the quantum internet is coming. Hi, my name's Rod Van Meter. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've been doing computing systems since, oh, the 1980s. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Caltech, where I studied under Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize laureate there on the left, and Ron Ayers, who you see below him. And then I did a master's degree at the University of Southern California, working with Deborah Estrin and with Kim Corner. And then much later in my career, just 17 years or so ago, I came to Keio University, where I did my PhD in, in computer science. My research area is quantum computing and quantum internet. And so today we're going to talk about the quantum internet. So I hope you'll follow along with me and get the new ideas for um, what's going to happen with the quantum internet as it develops over the coming years. All right, so the first thing I want to say is, well, quantum computers are here. You can actually use them today. They're real. There are companies like um, IBM and Google and Rigetti and IonQ that are out there making real quantum computers. And they're going to solve a lot of important problems for us as a society. So the kinds of things that we do with those, well, Feynman originally proposed quantum computers as a tool for doing chemistry. And so chemistry, if you're examining the equations that govern how molecules are created and how molecules come together and come, and, uh, come apart, the different reactions that occur, that's a really hard problem. So uh, Richard Feynman of Caltech proposed the design of quantum computers to help us solve quantum chemistry problems. And those quantum chemistry problems range from fertilizer to material science to industrial chemical processes of different kinds. So ultimately, you know, the um, president of Microsoft, for example, is fond of suggesting that quantum computers will help us improve the efficiency of manufacturing agricultural fertilizer. Now, agricultural fertilizer might not sound like a big deal, but in fact, there are parts of the process that are not well understood and that consume a tremendous amount of energy. Today, we invest 1% to 2% of the entire world's energy in creating fertilizer for agricultural purposes. So if we can improve the efficiency of that process by understanding the chemistry of it better, we can reduce the world's energy consumption. So that's big picture stuff. Right? This is how quantum computers are going to make the world a better place. Quantum computers are also being proposed as tools for analyzing many kinds of optimization problems. That includes moving goods around the world or reducing the materials you use in a factory, reducing your travel time from place to place. All of those kinds of things make the world a more efficient place. A third area is that quantum computers are actually being used in finance these days. Um, these are still, of course, just nascent applications, but the idea is that they'll help us understand the risk in particular financial investments better. So combine all of those areas together, and there's a tremendous amount of potential for quantum computers to dramatically remake the landscape of society by changing what it's possible for us to compute. But we can't do that unless we can figure out how to connect multiple quantum computers together and build a quantum internet out of it. So quantum internet is going to enable large-scale quantum computation. In fact, we can't get there without it. So the quantum internet is going to be one of the, the key technical challenges over the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years. This is a picture of an IBM quantum computer. That's Dr. Maika Takita, who, who is working on the quantum computer that you see hanging from the ceiling there. So these systems, there are many different physical technologies that are being developed for quantum computers. But this one that IBM is developing it depends on superconducting systems, and it works at very cold temperatures. So you can see in the figure here that there are a lot of cabling and a lot of wires coming down from above. All of that's to carry signals into and out of the, the quantum computer itself, which is actually just a small chip at the bottom of that device. And then behind MICA, you'll see a set of white cylinders, tall white cylinders. Each one of those also contains a quantum computer. So after she's finished doing this work, 
that one will be closed up and then the whole white container cools the system down very close to absolute zero in order to allow the, the quantum effects to, to uh, be undisturbed by noise in the, uh, in the physical system. So that's the goal. And to the left of Mica in this picture, you'll see a rack mount full of equipment. That's for controlling all of the individual parts of the quantum computer, the individual qubits. So these systems today are still large, but we're working on getting them to be smaller and getting them to be more accurate and getting them to have more capabilities. And one of those key capabilities is the number of qubits that's available in the system. So that's an IBM system. Um, and inside of that, there's a little chip that's Oh, you know, about the size of your thumbnail, maybe a little bit bigger. It's a two or three centimeters uh, square. Inside of that are wires and small circuits that look like what you see here on the uh, on this this photo. Um, surprisingly, these devices are actually much larger than the transistors in a normal computer chip. These qubits in them are fifty or a hundred microns across. They're almost big enough to actually see with your eye. You know, they're a a tenth of a, mi of a millimeter or so in size. And so one of the limitations is how many of those we can squeeze into an individual system. Now, there are other technologies as well. There's a startup company called IonQ, which is based in um, Maryland. And I have collaborated with one of the founders of uh, IonQ, um, Professor Jung Sang Kim. I visited his group at uh, Duke University um, a number of years ago. So this is a picture of one of their devices. Now, you're not seeing on, on this device the actual qubits in the system themselves. The qubits are actually, in this device, individual atoms, and so they're too small to actually individually see. What you're looking at here is the device that holds them and supports them and suspends them in a vacuum um, just above the surface of that chip that you can see, and then they're controlled from outside using lasers. So. We've got superconducting systems, we've got ion systems, there are other types of physical systems that are being developed for quantum computers. These are just two of the many examples. There are dozens that are being uh, developed around the world. For this particular technology, for ion trap, um, today it goes into a large device, you know, almost the size of the, uh, the white cylinders that I showed you a minute ago. But progressively the packaging is getting smaller and smaller and hopefully it will get to the point where the whole system will fit into a device that will fit inside your, your hand. And once we have those, then, then we have a great deal more physical scalability. We can put together a lot more devices into a single large system. And also, it potentially becomes uh, more useful for actually building out a quantum internet. I've told you that quantum computers exist, right? So what is a quantum computer and what does it do? Well, until the middle part of the 20th century, information was always analog. It was, you know, sound was an analog effect for recorded sound, writing is an analog system, any other kind of system you can think of is essentially analog. But starting in the middle of the 20th century, we switched to using digital circuits for, for computing. And then from those, the most common form is what we call binary circuits. But analog computers were actu actually existed and they were actually used until the 1960s. Then in the 1970s, by then, the analog computers were gone, and also we were starting to switch from using analog telephones to using digital telephones. So that transition from analog to digital happened over sort of the middle, the, you know, the, the, maybe the third quarter of the 20th century, let's say. Now, the next major advance in information representation or data goes from analog to digital to quantum, and the key ideas in quantum computing began developing in the mid-1980s. If you're sharp, you're paying attention, you'll notice that, that the person there on the right is the same one that was on my earlier uh, slide. That's Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate for his work in um, quantum chromodynamics. He proposed some of the key ideas behind quantum computers in the mid-1980s. Um, I was actually taking a class from him at Caltech. I was not one of his PhD students. I was just a random student in, in a class that, that he took. But I learned a tremendous amount from him. I don't remember him actually talking about quantum computers at that particular time, but we talked about a lot of things that are actually related, including what's called reversible computing and things like that. So the ideas have been around for um, almost 40 years now, and we're getting to the point where using the systems is starting to become actually really practical. So let's look at what these th systems can actually do for us. So we can think of 
the introduction of the laser and the transistor and the atomic periodic table and solar cells as the first quantum revolution. Um, a guy named John Dowling, who was a, a friend of mine, but he, he died recently, sad to say. Um, he proposed that what we're seeing now with, the, with these quantum technologies is actually the second quantum revolution. So that's going to bring us quantum computation and quantum communication and quantum sensing. He proposed that in a paper, um, oh, back in 2003. What do we need in order to take advantage of this? Well, we need two main things. Uh, sometimes I expand the list to seven, but we're going to talk about two of the elements here. We're going to talk about quantum entanglement and quantum interference. Quantum algorithms really run by building what we call interference patterns. And in order for those interference patterns to develop properly and to be useful for us to solve a problem, we need the quantum entanglement. So interference, you may, you may be familiar with the, the word interference, meaning like noise, but in this case, what we mean is something a little bit more mathematical. What we mean is that when you have two waves that come together someplace, those waves can either add up or cancel out, and that will change the, the size of the, wa the wave that you were seeing at that particular instance. And that's what you call interference. So here's an example of waves being created by rain droplets. And you can see that where the waves come out, they're spreading out in circles from, from where the droplet lands. In the places where two waves come together, you can see that sometimes the surface is just flat and level, and then sometimes it's actually bigger than it was before. That's where they either add up, which is what we call constructive interference, or they cancel out, which is what we call destructive interference. And so that's the core idea of what we're trying to achieve, except in sort of a digital fashion with quantum algorithms. We need to go from this idea of these basic waves to what we call qubits or quantum bits, and we're going to go um, we're going to talk about those as we go. So quantum data is still held in bits, like the classical bits that we're used to. You have two states, but there's some differences. So let's say we have one qubit. This is one quantum bit of data. That might be represented by some phenomenon that points up. Okay, so... This might be the spin of an electron or the state of a superconducting system or the polarization of a photon or something like that. And we'll call this our up state. Now, what we'll do in order to define how to calculate things digitally on top of this is we'll call our up state, also we'll call that number zero. That's our zero state in our system overall. Now, obviously, if we've got the up state, then we also have the down state. Now the down state, we'll write like this, and then we'll, we'll use that to represent a one inside of our system. So we have two states, zero and one, or up and down. Now, so far, that just sounds like a classical bit. But what makes quantum data different from classical data is that we can actually also be in what we call a superposition of those states where the system has this wave amplitude, how big the waves in it are, but half of the amplitude is in the up state and half of the amplitude is in the down state. Then we call it a superposition state. If you start with a single qubit in that superposition state, when you go and you measure it, you might find, for example, that there's a 50% probability of finding the state to be in the up state or a 50% probability of finding the state, the qubit to be in the down state. So it will be in one or the other. Um, it, when you measure it, you won't see the superposition. What happens is probabilistically you'll get one of those possible outcomes. So, for example, say in this case, maybe just at random we got the down state. Okay, so probabilistically that happened. So this is one qubit. What happens if we have more than one qubit? Well, if we have two qubits, just like with two classical bits, we have four possible states. So one of those states would be the zero, zero state or the up, up state. Um, one of those states is the up, down state, which would be zero, one. One of them is the down, up state, which would be one, zero. And one of them is the down, down state, which would be the state one, one. Now, I already told you that the, that the qubits can be in superposition, right? So let's say each of the qubits is set so that it has a probability of 50% of being found in the up state and 50% being down in the down state. 
Now with these four possibilities, um, up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down, then probabilistically we would expect that each of them has a 25% probability of, of showing up. That's reasonable. That's standard, basic, uh, classical probability. But that's only true if these qubits are independent, if they're not correlated in any way with, with each other. What happens if they are? Let's say maybe it's possible that, that the two qubits are in the up-up state, or it's possible that they're in the down-down state, but that the other two states definitely don't exist. So in that case, what we have is up-up plus down-down, and that would be the same thing as 0, 0 plus 1, 1. And what that tells us is that these two qubits are entangled. They are random, but not independent. Okay, that's the key to entanglement. We can write the entanglement like this. We can put these in sort of this superposition state, and you can say each one of the qubits is in this 50-50 state. But what happens with this and what happens with entanglement is that if you look at the left qubit, if you measure it to find whether it's in the up state or the down state, you're going to get one or the other, either up or down. And when you do, let's say we found the down state, then you know automatically that the second one was also down because their states are correlated. That's what's unique about entanglement. Um, this happens even if they're far apart, and it seems to happen instantaneously, but... This doesn't mean that you can use this to communicate faster than the speed of light. That's That distributed entanglement is the key of what we want to talk about with respect to uh, quantum computers um, and with the quantum internet. So if you want to learn more about the basics of quantum computing, there are lots of resources that are available on, on the web as well as fantastic books. Um, one place that you can learn is that we have actually created an online course through a company called FutureLearn and through KO University um, called Understanding Quantum Computers, and it'll take you maybe 15 or 20 hours to go through, and I think you'll find it to be worth your time. Thank you.